There are a couple of big ones that were really pretty striking. The yeah, Large Ginman Show, I think, was also a size 7, I believe. And the only reason it didn't get top, top prize was that the ginlin wasn't complete all the way down. So it's lacking a little, a little bit of the ginlin since that's a, the category it's in. <clears throat> so it, it ended up, the, the large one that you're referring to, which is tank 30, 26, I think it was uh, first place in ginlin A, but it didn't quite compete with the Sanke that was in the same tank. Uh, the Sanke in there was, was outstanding. Yeah, we have. It's really funny when you talk to people like Sakai and whatnot, and we used to try to pin them down on how do you judge a long fin, and they just wouldn't give us an answer because they don't want to judge a long fin particularly. And even at, but it's interesting now judging with the Japanese over the years, they don't mind judging long fin now. They still look at it as a as a koi with long fin essentially, and uh, this this show had some two outstanding long fin. Uh, the, the, their, the division was under 16 inches and over 16. Uh, both were outstanding. The over was a Kujaku, uh, which was really outstanding. So without the long fin, it would have won a high price as a Kujaku. The other one was a Doitsu. The under 16 was a Doitsu that uh, it, it's, it had to put it at like a Kinetsuri. Uh, but it, the color was outstanding. And of course, the Doitsu was a very striking color. The head was a little bit down, but that otherwise it was outstanding. And so not only are the, the, long, the fins becoming more beautiful, as all these had, we're getting the high quality koi uh, coloration and luster and patterns that, that we've been looking for. This weekend's show has gone tremendously well. As you can see around in your presentation, it has doubled almost since last year, even our vendors. We've got, uh, we could take more vendors, but no space, we can't do it. So I think the show overall success of this show each year becomes better and better. Uh, and now we're uh, you know looking forward to next year's show, which will probably be bigger and maybe at a different venue, so we can add more people and have more tanks and things of that nature. So. As, as you see the tent and everything else, we're, we're doing a great show this year. And it's uh, the work of five or six hardworking people who get in there and just do it. And then we, all our other volunteers are a great help too. But basically, I, I like the show, I enjoyed its venue, and I'll be probably plugging again next year. It's because I love the Koi hobby. Uh, and, and that's why most of us that get involved in the show do it. It's a lot of work, we bitch a lot, but we have a good time. Okay, well the show was, you know, it was very nice to come to this, this time. Um, the uh, weather was great, so it was nice to get a chance to get away from the cold weather at home. Um, they had very nice fish, um, good number of fish, um, some high sky quality up in, the, up in the top sizes. There was a lot of size uh, five and six fish, and then a few size sevens, but the, the fish was weighted uh, actually towards the, towards the top, size, top sizes, the top three sizes, which uh, generally doesn't happen, it's generally weighted towards the lower sizes. So it was a, it was a fun show to judge. Um, I think you know, eventually the, 
it was, I think, it was fairly easy at the top. Um, I think eventually, the cream came to the top as far as the, the best fish. Uh, the grand champion was a size seven um, sake, and just had everything going for it. it has a perfect uh, shiroji, white uh, white background, white plate. Had beautiful homogeneous he um, all throughout it. It didn't have the. It had some great sumi, great insertion of sumi. It didn't have it quite finished all the way, but still by far the most majestic looking, best bodied fish, um, and well deserving of the grand champion. So that was fairly an easy choice for the most. It was fairly unanimous the first time around. Well, of course, you know the, the things are changing on every aspect of the hobby with koi. Um, Filtrations changed a lot. When I first started out uh, 30 more odd years ago, we were using uh, our, the filter of the day was a Rubbermaid uh, stock tank with a lava rock. And the debate was, the only debate at that point was whether to bring the water up or bring the water down. So we, was, we either trickled the water over the top of it, or we trickled the water up and let it flow out the top. And was then the next debate was how often we have to take the rock and throw it on the ground and hose it down and put it back in the filter. Um, so obviously the filtration has gone a long way, um, so we can keep these larger fish and the fish can get larger. So I think we're seeing a lot much, lot more larger fish in the country, whether they're brought in larger or whether they're brought in smaller and grown larger. I think they're growing larger um, because filtration is changing and people can feed more to their fish without mucking up their mucking up their ponds. So I think the technology is changing what people can and can't keep and how many they can keep and how fast they can grow. And at the same time, I think, you know, as people have more success with better filtration um, and their fish are living better lives, looking better, living longer, I think more people are getting willing to go, th go up to that next level as far as spending, you know, a little bit more money on fish. So I think, you know, I think, and I think, you know, th th this is also changing in Japan at the same time. So at the same time as our technology is getting better and people are willing to buy a little bit more expensive fish, the opposite, not the technology part, but the opposite is having in Japan at the same time and is, and is less internal marketing. And more and more of the breeders are, are targeting the outside markets now, whether it be America or Europe or, or even just other Asian countries like Taiwan and, uh, and Taipei. Um, a lot of the good fish are going out of the country now where most of them used to stay in. Um, so now as, as long as you have the money and are willing to step up to the plate and spend it, almost anything's available to the to U.S. Um, a copyist now. It was there's nothing that's reserved or hidden, as people used to say. It's anything. Anything goes, and even two Englishmen can win grand champion at an All Japan show um, because it's it's available to us. So we're seeing more. We're seeing better fish coming in. We're seeing better bodied fish coming in. Technology is changing over there. More more and more fish are kept in greenhouses. More fish are grown 12 years around. Uh, more and more breeders are putting um, greenhouses down in the valley. Uh, more are taking southern ponds and mud ponds and growing out to get a longer growing year. There's a challenge to get the fish up faster. So I think you know the, the fish are getting better. The the genetics of the fish are getting better, and what's available is getting is getting better. Um, and more of it's going out of the country, so we have a chance to purchase better, and we can keep it better because of the filtrations and stuff systems that are coming out and. No. Well, it's hard to say. I mean, I don't know if my knowledge has increased over the years that much where it looks like there's more types of kohakus out there that I'm recognizing, where before they used to sort of look, you know, red and white fishes or red and white fish, they all looked alike. Um, you know, but back in 30 years ago, we were lucky to find domestic stock coming over, let alone Japanese stock. And, you know, every, it was, you know, orange and white. Nobody even called it red at that point. Well, it was orange and white fish. You know, so, I mean, now it's red and white, but then you still got the breeders and you start to notice the difference and the subtle differences between some of the colors, whether it be Dianichi red, whether it be um, uh, Hoshkin red or, or that type of thing. You're starting to see more and people are gravitating towards their favorites, Terrazzo, you know, type of red, which is totally different and develops different. So a lot of the reds develop and different and it actually makes it tougher on the hobbyist on the higher end because not only do you have to know the different types of red, but you have to know how they develop, how to pick out young fish, what it's supposed to look like, all the way down to Brady Goy, for that matter. <laughs> you, have to, you have to know how they develop and how the he develops because you have to know what to look for a three-year-old and not be disappointed if the red's not finished yet because that might be the best fish in five to six years as opposed to a red that's finished at two years. It might look good now, but you have to know how the red develops. So if you're looking for something long-term, Getting, say, getting right on down to, you know, just 
domestic stock being raised, which is getting higher grade as well too. I mean, that's the other thing we're seeing within the hobby now too. Is you know the domestic markets used to be strictly you know strictly for the for the people that were looking for hundred dollar and under fish, and there was very few little culling going on. They just raised whatever.